Vulcan Deck Masters Week 1. This is day one. We've casted one match between Gara and Orange. Gara took it 2 to 1, actually winning with a Shaman against uh, Freeze Mage, which was, I have to say, for me, unexpected. We're going to be going on to uh, Show vs. Surrender. So, pretty crazy match coming right up. But first, we'd like to take a uh, quick second to give a shout out to our two major sponsors. First, we have Vulcan, who are the people who actually put on this tournament. Um, it's one of the largest fantasy esports uh, websites, and they recently announced a $10 million prize pool for this year. You can play fantasy games for League of Legends, CSGO, Dota 2, and now Hearthstone. Um, and we actually have one other Blockbuster esports game coming soon. You can use the promo code DECKMASTERS to get a deposit bonus of up to $1,000. Uh, watch and chat with other fans at Vulcan.com slash Hearthstone. And go to deckmasters.vulcan.com for more information about this particular tournament. Yeah, I've actually made a team over there uh, very easily. Like, you basically go on the website, you make an account, and then you can start betting on the matches, however you feel about it. Um, I have my lineup for this tournament, but I don't know if it'll turn out to be as expected. So far, it's looking good. Uh, mine's kind of dropped pretty low. I had orange pretty high, so I was kind of I was secretly rooting for him in the uh, last freeze game match, but. I gotta say, I'm okay with Gara doing well. Yeah, it's been a while. Actually, Gara is one of those players who, you know, he's been around the competitive scene, but his last big win was a WCA, and it wasn't like a first mm -hmm. place. I think it was a uh, third place, if I'm not mistaken. So it wasn't like a first place. He's been around. People respect him as a player, but his tournament wins haven't been, you know, the most amazing. He's just a very solid all-around player. He's been representing Temple Storm for a while now. So, uh, I mean, it was, uh, it was a really good match, either way. Exactly, and again, everyone go check out the website. It's actually really easy to use. Um, I've never done fantasy esports before, and I was able to make an account and start betting within five minutes. It, it's great. It allows you to use PayPal. It's quick, easy, reliable, and very safe. All right. All right, so Show versus Surrender. Now, Surrender, for a lot of people, including myself, is an unknown player. We know he is from South Korea, and I know that he's placed top four in a relatively big event uh, in the region. Unfortunately, I don't know the specifics of it or which decks he was playing. So his play style is, you know, under, uh, completely uh, completely blank for me. I have no information about that. But Show, formerly of Complexity Gaming, now with Li Liquid, uh, has been doing pretty well. He did really well at Xfinity. And uh, also in Kingwin Pro League, finished fourth place, if I'm not mistaken. So definitely a good player. He's been doing very well recently. Picked up a mm -hmm. lot of uh, experience with multiple classes. And, and Sho, it turns out, is running Warlock, Hunter, Druid right now. And he's facing Surrender, a player that we were talking about a little bit earlier. We don't recognize his name very much. Um, I think I may have heard of him in some open tournaments in the past. But overall, he's a relatively unknown player. Turns out he is on Team Golden Coin and is from South Korea. And he was, oh, I guess he was second in World Esports Championships points. In All right, that might have been where I saw him. So it's been, uh, but it's been a long time since I've seen the name. So he's playing Rogue Warrior Warlock. His warrior was banned by Sho, so Sho doesn't want to play against Grim Patron. I'm guessing he's, you know, mm -hmm. worried about Grim Patron. And uh, Sho's Hunter is banned, so he's left with Warlock Druid, which means. Show weirdly enough, did not bring Warrior. I know that player as a, at least he used to be a very heavy control Warrior player, but I wonder how much he's picked up the Patron Warrior playstyle. Mm -hmm. Like, it's uh, not something sorry. everybody likes. You've got a cat? I do. My cat's attacking us. <laughs> That's she, fine. She wants, a, she wants to go on the Vulcan website. Uh, you have to hack the jungle But right. so, we have Surrender's Warrior Band, and then we have Show's Hunter Band. So that leaves us with show with Warlock and Druid over Surrender's Rogue and Warlock. If you had to take a guess, what versions of Warlocks are you going to expect to see in this uh, series right now? I expect Mali Ghost Warlock from Show for some reason. He strikes me as a player who would probably bring that archetype to attorney. Druid, I, like, it's funny how that class just kind of disappeared from the meta for a long time. I don't know if I'm just the, the only one, but it's like it's it was considered as one of the top most consistent classes for a long time and it sort of faded out. Like mid-range hunter became solid, warlock was all over the place with 75,000 archetypes. Um, patron warrior became a thing and then mage also, uh, the tempo mage came up. So druid loot lost a lot of steam, uh, but seeing players bring it back once in a while is pretty interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, uh, I wonder how excited. it'll pay off. One of the things about the classes of Warlock right now that I'm really excited about is I've seen multiple different types of archetypes do very well in tournaments. Obviously, we have the original Zoo, the demon-type Zoo that uh, 
Kaleno, I would have to say, kind of designed recently. Um, then we have, obviously, Handlock, which has been dominating partly due to the fact that it can be Patron Warrior. And then finally, we've started to see this Magos Warlock that has blown up in recent tournaments based on the fact that it does just as well against Patreon as, as Handlock, but it also dominates Handlock itself by running two big game hunters, two owls, and having the crazy burst from hand that allows you to take out your opponent. So I can really expect to see any of the three decks right now. Yeah, I think they're all very solid, which as a result means uh, everything's possible. It's just that if you're targeting Patron Warrior, maybe show brings Handlock. Um, he, because he did ban a warrior. Uh, sorry about that. My bad. Complete uh, complete opposite. Sorry. If he's targeting a warlock deck, which is you know probably the most sensible way to go about it, considering it's the most popular class, I guess. Um, you might be playing Maligos Warlock because I think that does excessively well against uh, mm -hmm. against handlock. So going in going into game one, it looks like Surrender will be using a zoo deck against Show's Druid. Now I right now I can see Show's hand, and it's perfect. Wild growth into Shade of Naxxramas, into Keeper, into Belcher. There's just nothing else you could want. He, he has the perfect curve, what you need. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I really like Show's Curves. They're, they're pretty cool. Show's Curves are amazing. But at the same time, there is one thing you have to take note of. Surrender does have a great combination of cards here right now. To have the I'm actually scared of this. Followed yeah. by the Void Terror. I mean, it, it's all about whether or not Show decides to use the Keeper on the Imp or Silence of the Egg. Like, in this position, we know for a fact that... I mean, I don't even know if he'll be able to stop any of that, unfortunately. For exactly. Him. It's going to be so painful. On, he won't be able to actually use Keeper right now on the Egg, so the Boy Terror will be coming down for free. And putting him with a 3-5, a 4-4, four, four, and a 3-2. That is not going to be easy for Show to beat. Now, what do you think Surrender's thinking about right now, instead of just dropping the Void Terror right away? Oh, well... I it's got to be the Void Terror. I mean, what else do you ever do in this position here? He do you ever sacrifice your Flame Imp? And force him to have a big game hunter? No, because he's just gonna silence your void terror if you do that. Instead of keeping, exactly. like, instead of keeping, yeah, never mind that. Because I was gonna say here he's got the option of either silencing the void terror, which makes very little sense. Um, oh, but it would have it would have actually been out of the big game hunter range. So I think that yeah, actually just, wouldn't have been a terrible choice. It's just very dangerous. I think you're going pretty all in on it. But you know, Show does have the double belcher, which is very important for him here. Like being able to stop some of the aggression from Surrender is going to be very important. Force him to make the Zoo trades, right? Zoo does play as a tempo deck very frequently, so they will take the trades they see. And if Show has enough minions on the board to stem the uh, excessive amount of aggression, that's going to help. But luckily, Surrender does have probably the biggest counter to Sludge Belcher, and that's the 5-5 five, five Lotheb. Um, that's one thing that I've always actually mentioned or talked about in the past, is Lotheb is not as good, or Lotheb would not be as good of a card if Sludge Belcher didn't exist. By having the 5 attack to trade out freely with the Sludge Belcher, like the biggest and most common defense in the game, it just boosts its power tremendously. Yeah. I, I really think that was Sludge Belcher that knocked Yeti out of the meta. It actually does make a lot of sense. Oh, we can see there's a bit of a glitch with the Keep of the Grove here not letting the, the spells go. Um, which has been, you know, on Blizzard's radar. Everything is on Blizzard's radar, did you know that? I, I discovered that a while back. Um, their radar actually encompasses just about the entire universe at this point. They, they, they do really understand when, like, different bugs exist. You're, you're completely right. They know what's going on. A lot of times it's not that easy to fix, but it, it's always good to know that they are doing their best to uh, get everything worked out. Right. All right. So that Belcher is not going to be that big of an issue, but if you look at the current board from show, Surrender still has to handle it. He has to find I, I some way to not get bled out too much because the druid doesn't really like he can use the he, he's forced to make the trades no matter what happens here well what would you think about just going face here putting him to 11 damage and setting up lethal with that power overwhelming since you've right got the owl he's... i think it makes quite a bit of sense that owl really makes you want to go for that lethal i, must safeguard. I would have probably considered that very very much so 
<laughs> the owl really allowing you to, to punch through any taunts that come up. And again, the Keeper of the Grove not letting go of the spells. What's wrong with you, Keeper? <laughs> oh, he does keep them. But both, both these players are playing quite quickly, and I, I have to say that that could, one, either be a mistake, or two, just show that both these players have so much experience with this matchup that they don't even have to think twice about some of their moves. Because for Sho all we know, a very experienced Druid player, in fact. I think it was uh, one, like, Sho, Druid, and Warrior, I think, are the two classes he is very well known for. Uh, those two classes are the, the two, I think, that he's played the most, as far as I'm aware. So, no surprise there. And he's so hesitating is... to trade, is what he's doing. He's afraid of Doomguard PO, but even if there is a Doomguard power boil, well, I mean, killing either of these two does not solve the problem. You would have to kill both. Mm -hmm. But not killing this will actually lend to lethal, so it's absolutely necessary. He has to but... at least kill one of those two, at the very least. I have to say, I do like that trade, though. That was a more efficient trade. It forces... Oh, an implosion is a great card to get here. Um, obviously, a Doomguard would have ended it a little bit sooner. But the fact that Sho has not shown a swipe yet means it's most likely that he's not just holding on to it. He would have used it in one of the past turns. Yeah, very, very dev. Like, there's no reason not to play it at this point. If you'd had it, you would have played it probably last turn even. Um, so you're going to hope that you're not going to get top decked, if anything, at this point. And even if you do, I think even a Surrender, you're going to be in a fine spot. Uh, oh wow, he's actually playing. There's a guy on the Hearts on Reddit in the background. His webcam is actually in a team house, is my guess. Oh, you're right. That must be Team Lucky Coin from uh, South Korea. They are... Golden Coin, yeah. Golden Coin. Don't mess with the Golden Coin. They're gonna get you. Oh, he's tired. Lad, that's it. He's out. I'm not playing Hearthstone anymore. Oh, he's coming to say hi. Mr. San Diego. <laughs> oh, God. All right. San Diego. This guy is uh, the MVP of this match. All right. Goes away. Never mind. Surrender. You're on your own. Uh -huh. And that, that's GG. And it's, Surrender uh, seems to be able to take it on his own with the power overwhelming and the low theft to get a two overkill on lethal. Yeah, San Diego Mojo really carrying Surrender here over Show, um, doing a lot of work for him. So he's going to take the first game. Zoo versus Druid. Again, we already know this matchup is lopsided in the favor of Zoo very frequently because Druid needs to god draw in order to mm -hmm. do anything. And even with the wild growth, I think an innervate would have gone a long way to even out the the, the tempo that the, the Zoo I, I gains agree. naturally. It's I would have to say that Innervate is actually, in terms of that matchup, more important than Wild Growth. You Innervate onto a Keeper on turn 1 or turn 2 is how the Druid wins that matchup. You just get some board control and the Zoo can never catch up. But again, right. once you let the Zoo start getting a board, the Dru it's on the Druid to find a way to catch up. And as most people know, it's Druid is kind of the deck who takes control and holds control. Once they lose it, it's impossible for them to get back into it. Yeah, it's basically a matter of... A, the snowball is unstoppable for Druid unless they find the Innervades very early. Surrender, gonna go on to his Rogue versus shows Druid again. Uh, I think Oil Rogue, and maybe I'm one of the few who thinks that, is slightly favored against the typical mid-range Druid. I'm not sure if that's a generally accepted stance, but it's I been my experience this, so far. I think at this point it is generally accepted that Oil Rogue does have the advantage in this matchup. Um, partly because, especially now that they're playing Violet Teachers and Shredders, that 4-drop... It's, they, it's again, it, they play like a zoo deck. They get board control, and the druid usually just has no way to get caught back up. Um, and then the fact that if the druid does somehow get full board control, the rogue can very easily get a deadly poison, oil play, flurry them all off, and they're back to square one. Yeah, I wonder, though, like why we haven't seen Assassin's Blade crop up in uh, Tinker Oil, I mean, Tinker Sharp Sword Oil deck list, because it is a card that is rarely punished anymore these days. Very few people. I think it's just a little bit too slow. It's it's without the current meta. Is it's everything is going so quickly that using a turn where you're turn five, if all you do is just get a weapon up for three damage, it's not going to be enough of a swing to keep you in it. Rogue is very a proactive deck. They clear their opponent's board and get something themselves at the same time. So practically passing a turn with the Assassin's Blade, it, it can be very costful at times. And I think that's one of the reasons it's kind of faded out of the Rogue decks. Well, that's a pretty good explanation. You know what? I'll take that and remember it. Um, it's basically just too slow in a nutshell, which I guess was the reason in the first place that it got phased out. I just figured with the advent of Patron Warrior and whatnot, to make sure you could you could say, I guess, that Face Hunter will always be there to punish your greed if you try to go for an Assassin's Blade. Um, but I thought maybe it would be relevant considering mm -hmm. the 
slower metagame. You know, Malagos Warrior, uh, Malagos Warlock, sorry. Yes, Malagos Warrior. Malagos Warlock is, you know, quite potent. You see a lot of handlock. And those cards aren't too bad against them. And, and so in this matchup, if I, I always think if the Druid does not get a Wild Grow start, he's done for. Uh, the Rogue is going to take this game from the start. Um, the only chance the Druid has is a Wild Growth, and then it becomes a very good game. But unfortunately, as we see, show did not get what he wanted here. Um, he didn't get much, and I, I'm afraid in the future, if Surrender picks up a prep at any point with a sap or something, um, the tempo gained from that play will really turn the tide in his favor. It's not quite there yet, <laughs> but it takes very little for the Rogue to get the tempo back, and it's looking pretty good. Although he, he hasn't quite found what he wants at this point. No prep, no sap in case uh, a taunt mm -hmm. comes up. Still a very slow start for both players. I really like this proactive play by Surrender, actually putting on the Deadly Poison prior to the Druid's turn 4, because he expects the Shredder to come out, and he himself most likely wants to either coin out the Lothep or the Drake, so he will not have the mana to also actually kill off the Shredder with the Deadly Poison. Well, that might be... Well, I mean, I guess you still play the coin. It makes no sense not to play Lothep. Although, no, what if do you're going to pop Lothab? the Shredder, you should pop it first. <laughs> There's always See, that I, chance things go super I, wrong. What do you think year. about using Drake versus Lothab? Because think about it, the Drake could draw into a backstab, which completely clear out the Shredder. It also allows you to use the Eviscerate the following turn. So many. Options. However, the Lothab does contest a Belcher more. Which do you think you would go with in this position? Lothab, I think, is only slightly better because it's going to kill the Belcher or prevent the Druid from playing it unless he's got the Innervate. But alternatively, when you think about the late turns where you're afraid of getting comboed down, Lothab can lock down a board where you've already got a slight advantage. So I think holding on to Lothab here might have been the right play. Oh, and Sho picks up a Shield and Mini Mod. I'd have to say that has to be one of the best two drops he could have gotten in this position. Oh man, Keeper of the Choose Ones is again glitching, but we're aware of the bug, apparently. It's a recurring bug since the last patch, and uh, we're gonna get it fixed eventually. Poor little bug. I think this is a pretty easy ping off the 2-2, keep the low step down. The Druid's not gonna have an easy time dealing with this. His Unless only option you wanna is... really keep it for Flurry, I mean, you've got a Deadly already set up, is that ever a thing? I would say the fact that he's running Tinker's Oil, which most rogues do, it's you never want to save it deadly. The three damage is not going to do much to Druid's board. Meanwhile, the four you get from Deadly Poison with a possible Blood Mage or Astro Drake on the board can be a much bigger swing of a play. So I think taking current board position is more important than saving it as is. Now, do you expect him just to drop the Emperor Thoris hand here? I think so, yeah. The amount of value he's got in hand is absolutely atrocious. Like, it, you can't not pick, take it. It's not even for the sprint. It's just for the Tinker's Blade Flurry. You've got a four-mana combo that's going to be to enable a really sick board wipe with Flurry. That's going to be five. Uh, I mean, it's really tough to to not pick up. Would you, would you have so considered sweet. actually keeping that Belcher alive so that you could get a more effective Flurry and possibly keep your Lothab in the game? And or either like the other way around, you either force him to to trade into it. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, I like shows wrathing for one, getting the card draw, and swiping the board down, using his one two to finish him off. Yeah, that's a very good play. I mean, he's already got double ancient of lore and two savage ore, so all he's gonna really need to find here is a uh, a single turn with force of nature, and that might just be enough. Mm -hmm. But then again, Rogue is able to muster up some burst very quickly. It's just that the Druid is sitting on 31 health. There's been no threat from Surrender during the course of the game, despite the fact that he got the Shredder. Didn't so do what, what would you do in this position? Right now, I'd, I'd personally be leaning towards the Shredder SI face eviscerate the 2-4. What do you think? I think just to set up lethal very soon, since you have Tinker's Sharp Sword and you've got the Flurry and you've got Fan of Knives to Cycle or Sprint, um, that's going to allow you to get that extra burst very soon. So I would probably consider it. Getting those minions on the board as soon as possible is likely to be the right play. And, and I have to say, this is one of the positions where Assassin's Blade would just be a completely dead card, which is what we were talking about earlier. It's You really want to get those minions down in order to force your opponent to... Uh, 
user resources answering it instead of developing their own board. Yes, Assassin's Blade could obviously just end your opponent very, very quickly just based on the damage, but at the same time it's passing a turn as a rogue, which is one thing you just never want to do. Yeah, I guess you'd have to play it much later in the game or keep it with Deadly Poison. Like, you can you can hardly play with Tinkers. It's uh, probably way too expensive. Mm -hmm. Do you think Sho's just going to start drawing for combo at this point? I'd venture to say yes. It makes too much sense not to do. I mean, you have to reach for it as fast as possible. There and he oh. does find the combo with the Innervate. That is going to be 22 combo. damage. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, he's going to have to wait two turns to get it off. And it's possible Surrender picks it up before then. But it's going to be very difficult. Do you go for the flurry play now? Like, is that ever a thing? The only issue, it doesn't kill off the Drake. Yeah, it doesn't finish. It. Well, no. can you do Phantom Knives with it? You have four... You actually can't You could, can't you do could that. Drake, Phantom Knives, trade 3-3 three, three if you feel like it, or go for Flurry play if you'd like. It's really up so to... So I think, I think that's his two options right now. Drake, Phantom Knives, or Phantom Knives, Weapon, Deadly, Flurry. And that would actually wipe it off the board and do quite a bit of damage. Um... I'd have to guess that's what he's going to go do, just because of the pressure it offers. Oh man, that's a slow turn. If he's going to sprint here, that's a very slow. All right, he didn't. I was very, I was very uh, worried, to be honest with you. I same when he when he hovered over that card. Yeah, I thought that, that, that was pretty much game. I think you have so, to make the flurry play here. Like uh, you, you hit face, you flurry. Combo. Yeah. Your opponent's been drawing, hasn't really played much on curve, which indicates that he's got either combo cards or very slow late game cards. So I think pu pushing for damage now when you can get lethal next turn is definitely the play. Now this uh, may force Sho to actually use his combo to wipe the board. Um, he or you just option. Ancient of Lore yourself and you rat the 6-3 and you're usually safe and then you just one-shot your opponent with a very it's fair streak of uh, <laughs> force of nature double savage war. I would have to agree, that is a much better play with the top deck of Wrath there. That is exactly what he needed. And still, Surrender knows that if he doesn't clear this board entirely every single turn, he's eventually just going to get taken out. Little does he know his opponent's got exactly what he wants as well. This will be the end of this game. There is nothing that Surrender could have drawn into. Um, you wouldn't have had enough mana for Healbot. I think actually, what if he finds an unstable ghoul off this? Oh, you know that could actually help quite a bit because it's going to kill two of the treants for all that's worth. It's going to force Show to slow down. Attack that was his best option. It's like the only way for him to get aboard and push for lethal next turn. <laughs> it's it's not a comfortable play to do, but with oil in hand, I think it was correct. But again, little does he know that Show does have the double combo. So keeping an eye on Surrender's face, just sees reaction. He knows it's there. <laughs> well, it's been, he, I mean, let's be honest, show has been holding on to the exact, you know, same five or six cars for the entire game. Surrender probably doubting that there's got to be something in there that's going to burst me down from 20-ish. Um, so yeah, 17 to minus one. That's but it, it, one looks like it looks like Surrender shrug shrugging that off pretty quickly. So I think he'll be okay for this final game in the best of three series. Yeah, it doesn't we, look very tilted at all. I think he's just keeping his head cool very easily. So it looks like we'll be having uh, Surrender's Rogue versus Sho's Warlock. So again, let's take a minute to think about it. Uh, what type of Warlock do you think Sho brought to this tournament? As I said, I think Maligo's Warlock is in... I think that's the type of deck I'd pin him on, but he's played Handlock. Um, mm -hmm. Before, so it's it wouldn't be surprising to me. I don't know that I pin him on Zoo though. If I see some kind of Zoo-ish deck, it's gonna have to be a mid-range lock that's more towards um, maybe on the aggression side, but it's gonna be mid-range baseline. If he plays a Zoo deck like a straight up, I'll mm -hmm. be surprised. But you know, you never know. That, you never know. Hearthstone. I, I'd have to guess that Surrender is hoping so much that shows in the Malagos Warlock. Um, that is such a favorable matchup for the Rogue. It, it usually puts the Warlock in a position that he just has no chance of winning. Um, There's no Molten Giant to swing back in. There's no exactly. Mountain Like, if you don't have the big taunts, Rogue doesn't have to sap much. There's only a you, few targets you really care to sap, and you, otherwise you just punch face and you get decent tempo. I'd have trick. to say that I, I think the only way that the Warlock can win that game is going from Twilight Drake turn 4, Twilight Drake or Belter turn 5, Emperor turn 6, 
and somehow keeping that emperor alive and then getting the Malagos burst. Otherwise, the rogue just has so many answers that every like the little one ones that he puts on the board don't do anything. Phantom knives is gone. Blade flurry wipes off all the three three right. size minions that the warlock throws down. So the rogue will win with the Imperial giant Imperial. giant burst they have. Yeah, I like it's no surprise. That's the strength of uh, Tinker's Sharp Sword Oil decks. It's like, wh- let's assume you're facing off against, I don't want to say Ram Druid as a go to, but if Ram Druid hits a good, you know, taunt curve, it feels a bit like what Handlock can feel like, where you just can't go through the taunts. At some point, you're running out of removal, you're face tanking way too much damage, they heal on the back end, whereas Malagos Warlock just doesn't have that potential. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, what do you think about the Rogue versus either Handlock or Zoom matchup currently in the meta? I, I, I'd venture to say, depending on the starting hand, Rogue can take it off against Zoo, but otherwise I'd pin it on a maybe 55 for Zoo, depending. It really depends on the Blade Flurry, then again, it's it's so volatile. I feel like the, the Imp Gang boss really made Zoo harder to deal with, even for Rogues. So it looks like we are going into the final game of the match. Surrenders Rogue versus Shows. It's definitely not Zoo, but it's hard to determine if it's either Giant or... Mali oh, yeah, Boss, I think yeah. it's Giant. I think... The- I think the Sun Fury Protector shows that he's going to be running the giant handlock version. Yeah, I think it makes it, like when you see Sun Fury, it's a dead giveaway that it's likely to be handlocked. Although you never know, maybe he's stacked in a Sun Fury in that Maligos Warlock deck. Maybe. No, this this is an interesting conversation. It's handlock used to be the deck to counter rogue. However, when talking to players like Firebat and Purple Drank, um, the, some of the biggest rogue players in the game, they do say that the new oil flurry builds have actually swung the advantage towards the rogue now because of the immense burst that they can actually throw out. Yeah, in turn. it feels a bit like uh, yeah, when you get that good. god draw with patron, the rogue just does it more consistently. Is basically how I feel. Like t- sharp sword oil rogue has been able to punish handlock for a while now, um, unless the handlock just has a disgusting tempo gain every single time. Okay. Especially this Violet Teacher is not something easy that the uh, Warlock can deal with. Um, followed by the Azur Drake backstab and then prep Eviscerate if necessary. That's going to turn sour, but Sho just getting out of the low tip here to counter the Violet Teacher. No spells, no one wants will be played here. And if that Drake comes out, it's uh, probably just going to get wiped out. Mm-hmm. And especially, yeah, the Drake is actually just going to get killed by the Dark Bomb, Mortal Coil most likely at this point. Yeah, that's going to be a great turn for show though. This is pretty much what he's looking for at this point. And Surrender considering punching the face of Lothab and taking 5 damage as retaliation just to make sure if it's trying to trade for Drake or the Violet Teacher, it'll at least die to Fan of Knives at the very end of the sequence. I think you would actually want to punch it twice because his next turn he most likely wants to get another Drake down just to kind of uh, continue holding the uh, board and well, have a strong presence. He could just Azure Drake prep Fan of Knives next turn if need be. Um, that is true. And, but if he's thinking about doing that, in which case you do probably want to hold the dagger and not attack. All right. Defender of Arcus, that does not do anything in the current board. Um, I, I mean, I think current- Shul's got a really great line of plays here. His hand is fairly secure. He can actually afford to cycle in a life tap. In this turn, where otherwise he'd have almost nothing to do, and he picks up a Drake for the following turn, forcing Surrender to probably... Oh my god! Fantastic draws by Show, back to back. Oh man, there is however a sprint with a prep in Surrender's hand, but he has to handle that Lothab. So maybe the Drake prep fan of Knives might come out with an unprepped sprint on the following turn. Although that's got to hurt. That has got to hurt if you do it. I think... Putting the uh, Drake on board, though, provides enough pressure that he knows Sho has used both Dark Bombs already. So mm-hmm. he expects his Drake to live. So no matter what kind of minion comes down, whether it's Emperor Thorisan, Giant Drake, he will have answers to it. It's going to be, by default, more manageable already. Now Sho's going to have to play around what he knows is likely. that he Statistically, at this point, there's a sap in your opponent's hand. So the question is... Which sapped minion bothers you the least? Um, it's pretty much what he's got to be thinking. I think either way, it might be necessary to tap before playing this minion, unless he really wants to get this one taunted up. I can't imagine that he's going to be too scared against just an Azurek on board when his opponent only has 7 mana and had just used a prep already. If you tap, though, and the sap comes out, you lose a card. Does that matter much? 
You're right, you do. Um, I don't think so. That much. Um, it's not like he already had Lothab. Like, so if he lost something like Lothab, that'd be absolutely brutal. But people really overvalue milling uh, a card in this game because the problem is, it, like, what's the difference between milling a card and it being at the bottom of your deck? Yeah, there's no difference. I guess it's because of Hearthstone. Since you only have two copies of specific cards, sometimes that can matter. But he just goes and silences the Drake. Um, that way, if a Sap does come out, it's going to probably be on the Giant either way. And he's going to have to take the first hit of the Dagger into the Owl. The Spell Damage Removal, I guess, plays around some kind of massive burst that Surrender mm -hmm. could pull off in this position. And very it, often that was actually happens. a very heads-up play because all he needed would have been a backstab of Viserate to mm -hmm. kill off this Giant. Mm -hmm. No, I really do like that from Surrender, playing around the obvious uh, removal piece. Now, do you like Lotheb, hit off the Owl, and then you do have the option to eviscerate and kill the Giant, but the question is whether he wants to or whether he just wants to start pushing damage mm -hmm. and force the Giant to actually attack into his own minions. You, the thing is, you haven't seen a single heal yet from the Warlock, so you're thinking he's sitting on some of those. Surely pushing for damage is vulnerable to uh, to a Shadow Flames later on. Mm -hmm. So it looks like he will opt to actually make the trade and wipe off his opponent's board. Alright, playing the slower oh. game here, so Handlock usually tends to get ahead in those. We'll see. I'd have to imagine Tap as a Drake in this position. No, I'm sorry, not Azure Drake, Twilight Drake. Twilight Drake, yeah. I, I was wondering for a second, I'm like, there's an Azure Drake in that handlock? Okay, no, he means uh, Twilight Drake. too similar. The cards Twilight. are the same. All right, well, Violet Teacher could be coming out any moment, but that 4-9, that 4-9. I like Violet Teacher, Phantom Knives here. Um, I, backstab could ba first. Could backstab Fan. Yeah, I think, okay, Backstab Fan and actually kill it off isn't bad. But again, it's just so susceptible to something like a Hellfire here. Or Shadow even the Flame is super <laughs> weak. Like, it's going to wreck this board. Like, Defensive Argus Shadow Flame is good enough. But he's gonna. Oh, he's just gonna kill it. Never mind. I didn't even calculate the damage. He, I didn't calculate that at all. This is what I mean with the Mortar Coil or Shadow okay, Flame. Okay, yeah, never mind that. Never mind that. But again, I feel like Surrender is playing very defensively when the Rogue is very much supposed to be the aggressor here. Um. A prep sprint would have helped a lot because one of the biggest problems you've got is that your options become more and more limited as the rogue in a position like this, whereas the the the, the handlocks options just increase. And if you push for damage too early, you start running into molten's a bit too quickly, which means you get to face eight eight with taunt. You don't have a sap in your hand. You feel a little uncomfortable. Um, so lots of reasons I think why surrender is playing defensively. But either way, uh, maybe he feels like he's forced to. I have to say, I'm actually a little bit surprised that he used the Hellfire with just the 1-1s one on board, instead of just using a Mortal Coil on um, the 5-1 there. There is but one we... good thing about this, though, for uh, Surrender, is that now he won't spawn 1-1s one to play Tinkers on. Oh my god, this oh, is... Oh, and it's on. This is going to be game over very soon for Surrender, being able to draw into the Prep Oil Oil Viscerate. And thinkers, this is just a crazy draw for Surrender, and there's no healing on Show's side at the moment, nor is there a giant. But we'll have to see what uh, what Show can pick up. I like this play from Surrender. Instead of developing the Blood Mage Thalnos, it's not necessary. You really want to kill that owl so it doesn't get a free trade with the Violet Teacher. I think it's necessary to go for... Well... Let's see, if you go face, he taps, he double giant taunts. Meanwhile, if you don't do that... Well, it doesn't taps, matter, you've got double tinkers, mana. do you care? I mean, you have blood mage, double tinkers, blade flurry, that wipes both giants <laughs> pretty effectively. So I think he's calculating the damage right now is whether or not he can actually get through this. Because he didn't yeah. want to run in the worst thing that could have happened, which I think he could have done if he attacked. If he was tap, double giant, taunt, heal... I think he had actually not enough mana for that play, but I'm sure it was in the back of his mind to be careful of. Yeah, because uh, like at some point, if they're on 13, they can't play all that stuff. Um, but now, Surrender is still having to handle... Wait, does he have lethal with double tinkers? If you start with prep, buff up your dagger so to 5. So, so it would be... Dagger, prep... Or 7. Yeah, I think he's got it. 7 to the face, plus 6, 
plus eviscerate. That should plus be Plus eviscerate, game. that should be it, yeah. And he's going to use the SI agent to clear the last 1-1 one, one off. And that's that game. will be there it, is. it. Surrender is taking this series 2-1 to one over show. That's it's an incredible draw really that's Prince. Yeah, that was a crazy sprint for Surrender, which, you know, the Rogue, as we said, a lot of people, and you mentioned Fireband and Purple Drank, think the matchup is slightly favored in the, you know, for Rogue now because of the amount of burst, and we just saw that. He had a crazy Blade Flurry, 7 damage Blade Flurry, which is very, very typical of uh, Tinkers in a very control, you know, a long, drawn-out control matchup. You will see a lot of those massive Blade Flurries to wipe out minions. And I have to say, I want to mention something that might be a little bit funny. Um, silencing that Violet Teacher may have cost him the game. That's what I said, yeah. It, it's, uh, it, it, no it one gave ones. the Tinkers the automatic hit onto the Violet Teacher instead of having the chance of hitting one of the 1-1 one, one minions. It's a misplay I've seen very often. Back when Tinkers was at, its, was at its prime, which, I mean, it's good now, but there was a time like for about a, a one week and a half or two weeks period where Tinkers was just the deck. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people silence Violet Teachers, and that's actually a drawback. It's not good. It's actually a drawback for you very often. And uh, it's actually the reason that a lot of people have started cutting Violet Teachers more in favor of the Shredders right now, just because of the drawback of that like exact example. Yep, um, so we sense. will be taking a break, but before we do, we want to give a shout-out to our other sponsor, Squarespace. Um, it's a, it allows you to design sites that are ex very professionally designed, regardless of skill level. You have no coding required. Um, it's very easy to use. I've actually seen how to do it. Someone like me, who's completely um, inept Who at was, yeah. doing I mean, I, I would coding. go there for sure, definitely. It's like it, whatever interface you get there is going to be super well polished. Um, the interface is well done. The graphical design behind it is super well done, and it's also not exactly expensive. So if you're looking to build up your own website for cheap and you don't have any experience as far as building them, then you can check out squarespace.com slash deckmasters. You can look that up. So we'll be right back after the break. We're going to be moving on against, uh, I mean, in the third match, Strife Crow versus Thoid. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Strife Crow, well, I'm sorry, you've been very, very missing in action as far as the Hearthstone scene goes. For Thoid, uh, he's been in about three big events so far. Uh, he's a very strong player, but for a lot of people, largely unknown. So we'll see him in action after this. Um, not a long break, don't go anywhere. <laughs> 